out in the SF Vortex for the second week of November, 1996. We don't want to upset the good folks back home. Then you better not tell this group of frequent flyers that they're infected with a killer virus. And Pandora's clock is ticking. Eventually, you're going to have to acknowledge that those people are going to die. A race of odd-looking creatures are back on the streets of L.A. in the newest Alien Nation TV movie. Sound like a good plot? I don't want to have anything to do with this case. Then how about a blast from the past? Are they going to be surprised? That's right. Battlestar Galactica lives on. So come get fired up as we take a look at the past, the present, and the future of sci-fi entertainment. Action, suspense, drama, thriller. You got it. Hey, we have it all. Everybody, welcome back to another edition of SF Vortex. I'm Roger Lodge, and folks, I'm happy as a cat on a shrimp boat to tell you that for the next 30 minutes, I get to be your host as we preview and review what's coming up in the world of science fiction entertainment. And coming up a little bit later on, we'll hash it out with authors George Clayton Johnson, Herb Solo, and Yvonne Fern Solo about what books make great SF movies and which ones don't. And by the way, how'd you guys like that sci-fi con, huh? Did you sign on with us? Boy, we had a blast with John Copeland, Warren James, Mark Altman, and the beautiful Chase Masterson in our War Room chat. Actually, we had about 150 of you join us. Thanks a lot. We loved having you. But enough about all that chit-chat. Let's preview this week, shall we? All right, it looks like the best new sci-fi is going to come from an old favorite. That's right, it's a new Alienation TV movie, and it comes to us courtesy from the folks over at Fox. It's entitled The Enemy Within, which actually was the name of a Star Trek episode by Richard Matheson way back in 1966. Anyway, Matt and George are back at this time to investigate the murder of a different kind of newcomer called an Eno. Oh, second of our time. They uh, are shunned by the other newcomers, and in particular by my partner, George. Uh, I am able to call him on uh, a, a hypocrisy that he exhibits in uh, his, his uh, discrimination against the Enos. Because of this prejudice, George is reluctant to investigate the murder, which could hold the key to solving a conspiracy that affects all newcomers. They didn't really have a choice. never gets too heavy. Like the series and the movies, The Enemy Within has comical subplots. Kathy and her clowns move in with Matt, and George gets a lesson in newcomer jealousy. Albert and May have come to George to have a baby. And as you know that in, in Tank Denise, uh, the only way to impregnate a female is with, with the help of a binom and a ganom, two males. So I have to provide the services to uh, you know, help out in my special way, but yet it's driving my wife, Susan, absolutely crazy because this is unheard of. Susan, I don't understand. Really? My husband says he's not going to have sex with me for a month, so if you calculate with another female, and I'm supposed to be delighted. <laughs> well, <laughs> The Enemy Within was originally slated to air in October, but it was moved to November sweeps which is one of the biggest months for network television. Now, that's probably a good sign that it's a good one. You don't want to miss it. The newest Alien Nation movie airs this Tuesday night on Fox, which, by the way, might be a problem because if you watch Alien Nation, you'll miss the second part of Pandora's Clock over on NBC. So don't forget to set your VCRs. The miniseries stars Richard Dean Anderson. Of course, we all remember him from MacGyver fame. I remember him as Terry Hatcher's ex-boyfriend. Anyway, here's a look at what it's all about. Build an all power. This is 6 6. Is that the best you can do down there? Yeah, stand by. Max power, left side. Max power. Third. Young Captain is crazy. Executive this 
Precision meets Outbreak in Pandora's Clock. In this two-part miniseries, a deadly virus is released on an international jetliner. No country will let the plane land, and the clock is running for the 250 passengers on board. Eventually, you're going to have to acknowledge Pandora's Clock also stars Jane Leaves. You know her from television's Frasier. Leaves says that unlike her sitcom role, Pandora's Clock seems more plausible than fiction. It's, it's certainly within the realms of probability, um, you know, and I think uh, that's what makes it so scary because it's quite possible. Just one more thing, Captain. Pandora's Clock is a two-parter that begins ticking on NBC Monday and Tuesday nights. Now, if you like that kind of story, check out UPN's Burning Zone. Hey, they chase down a different virus each and every week. And by the way, folks, next week, we'll take you backstage for an inside scoop on an upcoming episode. Now, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have to go to work or school on Monday, check out the Sci-Fi Channel's Battlestar Galactica Marathon from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Remember when Galactica first came out in 1978 and how it was described as the Star Wars of the small screen? Well, recently we caught up with Apollo, of course, played by actor Richard Hatch, to find out what he's been up to and what he thought about the comparison. It may have been inspired by Star Wars, but Battlestar Galactica, to me, had just an incredible opportunity to explore some themes that most people now are just really starting to get into. Galactica ran on ABC for only 23 episodes. Despite low ratings, the series inspired a cult following that is still attracting viewers today. Because I've been running around the country saying, Remember Battlestar Galactica? You liked it, right? You want more? It's a warrior to do after he's lost the big one. Come on and feel the loneliness. Battlestar Galactica had that theme of man searching for his heritage, man searching for his roots, and I think that we had that perfect blend of action, story, and mysticism that really makes science fiction so uh, compelling. Hey, you see that? Richard Hatch is just like us. He wants to see the series revived. But as the ending narration said, the last Battlestar Galactica leads a ragtag fugitive fleet on a lonely quest. Sounds like my social life. Now, whether or not the quest ends in a new movie or a new series, only MCA Universal knows. So for now, we'll have to be happy with the reruns. Here's another TV update. Actress singer Vanessa Williams is going to make a trip to the 24th century on Deep Space Nine this week. And don't forget to watch Futures End Part 2 on Voyager. Wasn't it kind of weird to see Janeway and crew in our time? Let us know what you think, folks. All right, don't go away because coming up next, what books should be made into sci-fi movies? It's the War Room Debate of the Week when we return. All right, welcome back to SF Vortex, everybody. Now, believe it or not, folks, more than 1,500 sci-fi, fantasy, and horror books are published every year, but only a handful have made it into the movies. Why? Well, we're in the war room to tackle that issue with author George Clayton Johnson, whose credits include co-authoring the book Logan's Run and episodes of The Twilight Zone. His latest book is Twilight Zone Scripts and Stories, published by Streamline Pictures. Also joining us is Herb Solo, producer, author, and former head of three motion picture studios where, among many of his hirings, Gene Roddenberry to develop Star Trek. And he's also the author of Inside Star Trek, The Real Story. 
And also here is Yvonne Fernsolo, author and lecturer of science fiction and literature, and author of Gene Roddenberry, The Last Conversation. You guys also have that project over at Paramount that I guess you can't get into, but we'll get to that another day. My topic is number one. Here it goes. Favorite book, sci-fi book, turned into a movie. My favorite, in case any, any of you care, is Salem's Lot. George, your favorite, go. Start us off. Journey to the Center of the Earth. Why? The caverns, the mystery of it, the idea that ancient civilizations existed before this one. Just the sense of exploration. One of my greatest heroes is uh, Christopher Columbus. Oh, okay. All right, Yvonne, your favorite? Um, the Time Machine. Why? Because I saw it when I was 10 years old, and I was uh, mesmerized, hypnotized, adored it, loved all the ideas in it, and thought I could uh, imagine myself going to all these different places, but uh, w wondered why you didn't go back in the past as well as the future. Mr. Solo? 2001 A Space Odyssey, Arthur Clarke's works that uh, eventuated in that film. Okay. Because of the fact, you're asking? I'm asking. Because, I'm asking. because of the fact Why, that Herb? it's... I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, there to four, uh, mostly science fiction or horror and globs of the week and the giant rooster eating Tokyo and such. And suddenly we came upon a literate, illiterate science fiction movie Whoa. that dealt with ideas. Time Machine was literate? Time Machine was literate. Time Machine was also came out of the George Powell world of... of, of it's, it's a different world. It's... Well, we'll argue George Powell and Stanley and Kubrick, two different people, two different thought of processes. Love 2001 also. Thank you. Okay, well, now, George, while you're here, I want to talk about Logan, Logan's Run just for a second. Sure. I thought with that cast, you know, and I, I, I saw the movie, I loved it. I saw it when I was about 10 years old, and I thought it was terrific. I was mesmerized by yeah, this film. Me too. Do you think that book translated well onto the big screen? I think it did. Do you agree with me? No, I don't, with a great big yes involved. <laughs> Beautiful. Elaborate, please. Beautiful casting. Perfect casting. Mm -hmm. Michael Lovely. York, Peter Ustinov is the world's oldest man. Wonderful stuff. Even Sarah stuff. Fawcett was in there. It's wonderful stuff, all of them. Sure she was. A young now, Sarah Fawcett. What more can you ask for? Go ahead. Now, you've got the cotton candy look of the picture. Mm -hmm. You've got the Jerry Goldsmith uh, score. Mm -hmm. You've got some really bravura performances, like Roscoe Lee Brown playing in, inside the glittering uh, creature. Mm -hmm. When I look at it, when I hear it, when I saw the poster art on it, when right. I saw the sales approach to it, top drawer. When I went to the Cinerama, th or the, yeah, the Cinerama Theater and I heard it with full sound and all those things, right. for the first 30 minutes I was entranced, even though I didn't recognize the book per se. But then my suddenly my fanny turned to stone. <laughs> That has been a problem of yours, George. Oh, yes. wait a minute. Now, did the book work for you? <laughs> well, so? a, let's, uh, let, let me defend what happened at the time. It was a time, as George knows, when MGM was going through different managements. There were, I mean, every other year there was a new management, and the old management would, would sweep out everything that had been done. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was no money. And without money, it's very difficult making science fiction films. See, even then, the effects were important. You're creating a whole new world, the world of, of, of Logan. So uh, I think what, uh, what uh, was lost when they did it, and which, which, uh, what is George is talking about, they lost the story. Right. They went for the effect. Well, they went for what they could afford to do in the look of it. What a lot of producers do, I know they did it with Ocean's Eleven, my first movie, is they buy a book because they love the idea. It's a great idea. It just happens to be they don't care for this story, but what if you turned that into an Ar Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger thing and then you brought in so-and-so? <laughs> it would be so great, and they see that. They obviously didn't buy it for the story because uh, William F. Nolan and I wrote a speculation script on it, which right. was never purchased, okay. but which follows the book. It's about 140 pages and one of the best things I've ever written, All along right. with William F. Enough about Logan's Run. Let's move on. Uh, Yvonne Fern Solo, tell us about the worst Translation. Nightfall, book. absolutely nightfall, written by uh, Isaac Asimov and um, Robert Silverberg. Spectacular book. The only thing in common that it has with the movie is the title. I thought I was, I, I sat in the theater and I said, What is <laughs> this? Got home, uh, wrote a letter to Isaac Asimov, and last week we were. You uh, wrote him a letter? Yeah, I said, You know, how could you let them do this? Of right, course, right. being ignorant, <laughs> like he had a choice. And uh, it, it, he said, absolutely. And we, uh, Herb and I had uh, dinner with uh, Bob Silverberg a couple weeks ago, asked him the same question, and he said, you know, 
I mean, it, these are things that just, ha we, I can't even think about it. It's so stupid. Yeah, yeah, what, what happens is these guys, for reason, do not live in Hollywood. Herb, tell me real quick, before, <laughs> yeah, we, go to, true. before we go to a break, Herb, yes. tell me real quick, a book for you that didn't work, just didn't work for you on the big screen. A uh, book for me, I would uh, have to let you go to a break, and I will think on it. Okay, while he does that, think about it yourself at home, folks, and we'll talk about it when SF Vortex returns. All right, welcome back to SF Vortex, folks. We're still in the war room with authors George Clayton Johnson, Herb Solo, and Yvonne Fern Solo. Mr. Solo, we left off with your uh, worst book to movie translations. You come up with one? We have it. Let's go. In the late 20s, early 30s, producer H. Marion Cooper had the good sense to make a movie called King Kong. In the early uh, 70s, another producer had the bad sense to make a remake of King Kong. <laughs> so there you have it. There you have it. Okay, let's get to some books that you've read, some classics that you think need to be made into movies. Yvonne, start us off. Uh, first and foremost, I, Robot, written by Isaac Asimov and uh, uh, Harlan Ellison, and Isaac uh, wrote the script, which is spectacular. I, Robot, we have a letter here from Mr. Bill Beckman, one of our faithful viewers. He agrees with you. He thinks that I, Robot would be an excellent movie. I disagree, but why do you think it would be such a great movie? Uh, Bill's right. Bill's right? Yes. There you go, Bill. <laughs> Smart man. Be because it really is a magnificent story, and, and there, there's a poignancy in the robot that is just spectacular. However, over and above that, I think another one of Asimov's books should be made into a movie, and that's called Robots of Dawn, because it is truly... That I agree with. ...original right. science fiction. Right. R original planets, original characters, original thought, original everything. It's just, and it's a great story. It's a detective story. George, you got any books that you've written, some classics that you think should be on the big screen? That I've read, you mean? Yes. Exactly. Gully Foyle is my name. Terra is my nation. Deep space is my resting place. The stars, my destination by Alfred Bester. It's my all-time favorite sci-fi adventure book. It would take about seven hours to tell the tale. Right. It would cost billions and billions to make. Well, we don't have that budget, and we don't have seven hours, but can I write? But when Nolan and I sat down to write Logan's Run, right. we were trying to do something like The Star's My Destination with a Ray Bradbury lyrical overtone, ah, if possible. Right. If possible. But yes, The Star's My Destination, Wilson Tucker's book, The Long, Loud Silence, story about after the bomb and the savage conditions mm -hmm. that exist whenever the civilization is breaking down. And uh, The Demolished Man, another one of, uh, of uh, Alfred Bester's works. What makes it so fantastic is that people cannot figure out how to visualize telepathy, and it's a story about telepathy. Mm -hmm. It's not a visual phenomenon, it's an oral phenomenon. And if somebody made an audio tape production of The Demolished Man, there would be a book that could be transformed into a different kind of a media experience. All right, Herb Solo, a couple of your favorite books Years here. ago, I had the privilege of working with a, a writer, Theodore Sturgeon. Uh, we worked together on television projects and on movies. And uh, I had the privilege of, uh, of uh, doing a, a film based on one of his novellas, Killdozer. Uh, but the one book that we used to talk about constantly was More Than Human. Uh, and Teddy, as we know, was more than, than just a science fiction writer. He was a marvelous, marvelous writer. I don't think it will ever get made. I think because it deals with character and it deals with ideas. And I don't think there is a special effect available today for characters and, and ideas. And I think that goes for many, many of the better science fiction works out there today. Do you think that... Let uh, me argue with him about this. Argue? Go. That's what this war room's all about. I think it would make an amazing story. Be the problem with it is no one can figure out how to do it because it's originally written as a novelette called A uh, Baby is Three, and then he tacked on a thing called The Fabulous Idiot, and then he tacked on a thing <laughs> called Maturity, and all of these make one huge conglomerate novel that somehow synthesizes together into, s into a unity in your brain, although in its ordering, it is a chaos. Well, I understand. The but story understand. starts in the last I, I act. I understand. But when you start it there, then and you encapsulate the whole story, then you have some stuff that is very, but very George, exciting. But, George, it, is, it isn't a matter of whe whether it should get made, it's whether it ever will get made. Well, we know... My concept is it never will get made. We know that in order for anything to get made, 
first of all, has to have a very strong idea that en enormous money is put out on it. And ultimately, if everyone does his job right along the way, it turns into a decent masterpiece of a p picture. There you Otherwise, go. it's a piece of junk. There you go. We got to get out of here. We're out of time. I want to no thank George about. Clayton. Yeah. You guys talk later. <laughs> okay. I want to thank Herb and Yvonne Solo, George Clayton Johnson. Don't go away, folks. There's more from SF Vortex when we return. All right, be sure to keep sending us your ideas for future War Room segments, folks, and your comments on Classic Trek versus New Trek. Email us. Wraps up another edition of SF Vortex. Make sure to join us next week. We're going to talk about a major film event, Star Trek First Contact. Dad, feel better. I love you. Good night, everybody. See you next week. shape, brightly lit, traveling at the speed of light. Witnesses from all over the world have seen them, but now the real investigation begins. Uncover the mystery on Sci-Fi Channel Sightings, coming up next.